views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello and welcome to OpenBXRX, BronxNet special coverage providing you the latest information, resources, services, and community efforts taking place locally here in the Bronx and virtually during the pandemic. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, and today is Election Day, Tuesday, November 3rd. Coming up, We'll learn some election day tips and reminders to help you vote in person or absentee today with the League of Women Voters New York. Then Movement School NYC joins us to discuss their Green New Deal for public housing NYCHA residents. After that, we'll share how you can support local artists and businesses through the South Bronx Swap Meet. And Council Member Vanessa Gibson reminds us of the importance behind the Bronx vote and rallies the Bronx to get out and vote safely today. So please stick around. Open BXRX starts now. Welcome to OpenBXRX on BronxNet. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, inviting you to get social with us at BronxNet TV on Instagram and Twitter and BronxNet Community Television on Facebook. Today is Election Day, Tuesday, November 3rd. Here to share some Election Day reminders and tips, help you learn how to vote safely in person or via absentee, and more are Crystal Joseph and Ashmi Chef from the League of Women Voters. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today, ladies. Thank you for Thank having you. us, Sanji. Of course. So just for those who may not be familiar, can you give us a little bit of background on League of Women Voters and your mission? Sure. Um, the League has been around for over about 100 years now. Um, and our main goal is sort of issues, issue-based uh, civic engagement and making sure that the community is aware of issues that are relevant to them. But our core mission is on advocacy and education of voter registration, the process, making sure that folks have everything they need for today. Today is the main event. We want everyone to sort of vote. And, and this is what we're here for throughout the year. So even when it is not the election season, we are here training the population to know about the process of elections, what are some of the upcoming issues that will be on the ballot. And we really begin the conversation November 4th, for preparation for the upcoming election cycle. Invaluable resources available at the League of Women Voters and why. So thank you for the work that you do. Um, ladies, I wanted to bring up that nearly 60 million Americans have already voted early before today. Um, here in the Bronx, lines were very long and voter turnout seems higher than ever before through voter early voting. Can you tell us what um, League of Women Voters and why has observed throughout the process? Any challenges with turnout and the overall mood of folks voting early? I think the energy has been high from the public. Um, I would say that most of the folks are excited about the process. This is the first election where early voting includes the presidency. Um, we are seeing some challenges at the Board of Elections just in terms of the support and what folks actually need. And we're actually taking account of those issues to make sure that we work through what they could potentially be and how to rectify those issues for our further election cycles. Um, but it's exciting to see people take advantage of these early voting days. It gives folks good options to make sure that we legitimize our democracy by turning out the vote in high numbers. That's what we want to see. Absolutely. Ashmi, did you want to chime in as well? Yeah, thank you. Um, so in terms of early voting, I actually early voted uh, at Madison Square Garden on October 24th, right when it opened. And I stood in line for about four hours. But while standing in line, um, what I found was a lot of optimism and hope. People were peacefully standing in line. Um, the poll workers are really positive about the process. Um, what I do think is a concern is, you know, anytime voting polls are open until 9 p.m., but if you're in line um, during at 9 p.m., you can wait in line and still vote. And so I think that's where, you know, thinking about uh, the quality of health for poll workers and making sure that they have the resources that they need 
um, at those polling sites to to really carry out this responsibility that you know you're on your feet all day, you're talking to folks all day, you're trying to answer several different types of questions. So it's just um, for me when I was standing in line thinking about uh, poll workers and, and making sure that we have uh, more than enough volunteers at the polls. Right, absolutely. A, you know, grave concern for poll workers. And it's a great tip to, to know that if you're standing in line for four hours, even if it hits 9 p.m., you can still wait. Yes, vote. you can yeah. still wait to vote if you are in line. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, Crystal, Ashmi, I love referring folks to the League of Women Voters Vote 411 tool. Can you tell us more about it and how folks can use it, what they can find out using that tool today? Sure. Uh, Vote 411 is our national repertoire. It's a sort of a database where folks can go in, input their local address, see what's on their ballot, find out information about how to request an absentee ballot, see all pertinent dates that are necessary for registration, election date, your poll site hours, and really see the breakdown of where your election day site is, your early voting site, and the distinctions of the two hours of operation. It's a comprehensive resource that folks can use across all the states, and we encourage people to take advantage of it to especially learn what's on your ballot for the upcoming election. So Vote411 um, has a checklist for first-time voters, and here it'll help you register to vote, it'll help you find your polling place, It'll help you see what's on your ballot. And then it'll see, it'll let you know if you need to, an ID to vote, and then it'll help you vote itself. So we go through every single stage and provide those resources that you need to make this as easy as possible. Um, as you know, you know, we have a big election cycle next year as well. So making sure that yes, we have you know, our election today, but we also have one next year for city council and making sure that you have to register to vote um, for all of these local elections as well. Definitely use the vote411.org tool in order to find out who is postulating themselves for a local election in your district. As we know, every district is different. We have different candidates postulating themselves to represent us in all different areas of the Bronx. So please use the tool in order to find out more information. Um, so we have two different ways to vote today. As we know, we can vote in person on the lines or absentee. Can you tell us about the importance of choosing a voting method and creating a voting, voting plan for today? I think it's important to make sure that you have something that would work for you for today, right? And so with early voting in, with early voting passed, now we have sort of the absentee ballot to make sure that it is postmarked today. So make sure that that does go in the mail for today and that if you do vote in person, that you're making sure you're choosing one option or the other. Right. And so I think one of the things we want folks to do is to have a plan, use a mechanism that works for you. If voting in person is the best way for you, you can bring that ballot into your site and cast your vote that way as well. So we want folks to do something that feels authentic to them, keeps them safe, but also make sure that their voice is counted for today. What are some do's and don'ts for absentee voting? I know that one of them is that you have to make sure you circle in the bubbles um, instead of, as opposed of um, marking X's and check marks on an absentee ballot. Anything else that folks should watch out for when voting absentee? Um, making sure that the signature is on the back of the absentee ballot and that you're checking that temporary illness box. Those are the two key elements. And again, as Crystal mentioned, um, it's really important. You don't have to wait in line on election day if you already have your completed ballot. So please just feel free to go to your polling site, submit that um, absentee ballot, and it will be counted. Thank you both. Um, before we go, can we just emphasize the importance of exercising your right to vote today, especially in the Bronx, just motivating and riling up viewers to get out and vote today? I think most of the time people often dwell too much on my vote doesn't count or it doesn't matter for me. But we don't explicitly say that we have a right to vote. But what we want to do is the more people who come out to the polls, it legitimizes the process for everyone to be counted. 
And we want to make sure that people have the opportunity to say, this works for our democracy. I have to make this happen because the cost and the trade-off is just not worth not turning out. And I'm always proud of Bronxites. We continue to do a wonderful job and show up even when we know that the process may or may not be easy. We do the work and I'm consistently encouraged by Bronxites and I'm consistently encouraged each election cycles that post folks will do their due diligence, find out what's on the ballot and turn out to the polls and just make the process as fun as possible. Ask a friend, encourage a neighbor, let folks know, you know, use your sticker, I voted, did you, you know, and just keep the narrative going. No matter what, the process is fun, it's exciting, and it really gives us something to look forward to each and every year. Ashri? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, your voice matters. Um, don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. And so make sure that when you're casting your ballot, you remember that that's your voice as part of our democracy. Um, and the more of us that share our voices to this democracy, the more change that we'll see that we want. And so it's making sure that our communities are counted, that our communities' voices are lifted um, and elevated into this space. So, uh, you know, local elections matter, national elections matter. Please be sure to vote in every single election. Um, that's really my message to you. Thank you so much, Crystal Joseph and Ash Shet from the League of Women Voters and Wife for joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. Bronx, get out and vote today, election day, November 3rd. If you're voting absentee, make sure you drop your ballot at a poll site by 9 p.m. today or at the Bronx County Board of Elections office no later, no later than today by 9 p.m. If you're voting in person, you can find your poll site at vote411.org. Just remember to wear your mask, remain six feet apart, and safely head out to the polls to have your vote count and your voice heard today. You can also follow the League of Women Voters at LWVNYC on social media. We'll be right back. Bronx Native and City Bike presented a bike ride called The Bronx is Beautiful. Riders took off at the Bronx Native shop in Port Morris and headed towards Randall's Island for a day of community activities. This ride was created, was curated because of the year that we've had, right? 2020 has been a very challenging, struggling year, and we feel that uh, we need some peace, some tranquility. We need some more community in all of us. People from the Bronx or beyond the Bronx can not only stay healthy, but see the beautiful uh, parks and the beautiful areas of the Bronx to a different vantage point. This is something that I've been promoting every year with Tour of the Bronx, but we can't have the traditional Tour of the Bronx, so we've been doing different rides with different organizations, and I'm just happy that uh, today I'm able to do this with Bronx Native. While some riders bought their own bikes, City Bike provided complimentary rentals for participants. The bike share system recently expanded to the South Bronx. We're expanding our, our stations into the Bronx at a time where you know people need safe and reliable transportation. And as a part of our community engagement, we wanted to work really closely with neighborhood businesses and organizations to make sure that people feel comfortable on a City Bike and know that City Bike is for everyone. We actually have $5 reduced fare bike share membership. It's $5 a month for anybody on SNAP and NYSHA. And again, this is a way to make sure that everybody has equitable access to bike share. Once participants took off and arrived on Randall's Island, socially distanced activities included poetry. In this cryptic break dance apocalyptic review, their scripted trajectories for us and revise it. Some yoga by the waterfront. Exhale out. And meditation. All of this will be over very soon. It's a day of self-care, day of wellness. You know, the first station, uh, we have some poets, me included, uh, and Jessica Diaz, which is in the BX Writers Anthology. And you know, just reciting some poetry about how much we love the Bronx, how the Bronx is beautiful. Writers rode back to the Bronx Native Shop to enjoy some empanadas by Empanology. If you couldn't make it to the Bronx's beautiful bike ride, follow at the Bronx Native for future events. Reporting for BronxNet, Sanji Lopez.
Welcome back. Movement School NY seeks to cultivate leaders and organizers to fight on behalf of their working class communities through grassroots engagement. Through their work, they've, tra they've trained public housing tenants to organize and build political power while advocating for NYCHA's Green New Deal. What is that Green New Deal and what will it mean for public housing residents? Joining us now to share more is Ilona Duverge, co-founder and New York City director of Movement School. Hi Ilona, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be on and, and talk about this Green New Deal for NYCHA, especially in such a critical moment, you know, having a presidential election coming up um, and also being in the middle of a pandemic. Absolutely. Thank you. So we'll definitely get into it. Before we start, though, for those who are not familiar, can you just tell us a little bit more about Movement School and why and your mission there? Absolutely. Um, so Movement School honestly came about um, based on a lot of the different um, gaps that I was seeing in the current organizing infrastructure that we have, the way that we run campaigns, the people that create the strategy to run campaigns. Um, I got the opportunity to work on a campaign when I was just 19 years old. It was my first campaign ever. I had no, absolutely no experience. And I started off as a volunteer um, and then quickly got promoted to be the field director because the consulting firm that we were working with um, could not find a field director that spoke Spanish. And it was so critical that we found a field director that spoke Spanish because we were running a campaign in a district that was 65% Spanish speaking. Um, and the consulting firm, you know, gave me this quick crash course on the technical back ends of how to run a field program and how campaigns are actually ran. And I saw a lot of issues. Um, one being, you know, the way that um, consulting firms and, and, and usual, um, you know, campaign strategists think about targeting. Um, the current tools that we have right now tend to exclude young people and people of color because we do not fit the modeling. Uh, for example, uh, people like me, I'm 23 years old, Latina, um, you know, I am not considered a highly a highly likely Democratic voter in the current modeling, um, uh, in the currently modeling system that we have right now. Mm -hmm. uh, although I've never missed an election since I've been eligible to vote, mm -hmm. right? So when I was taught all of this, I had a lot of questions. You know, for example, why is our target universal, the people that we're talking to, why are they predominantly older um, or concentrated in a specific part of the area that is more affluent? You know, where are, why aren't we talking to Latinos? Um, our, you know, our candidate is uh, first generation Dominican um, American. Why are we doing, a, you know, a robust Latinx outreach? Our candidate is 28 years old. Why are we not um, doing outreach to the youth? And they looked at me and they, they laughed. <laughs> um, and at that moment, I got so upset because I felt as they were laughing at me. Um, because here I was, 19 years old, giving my summer up to work on this campaign for a candidate that I actually, you know, for the first time ever, finally saw myself in, saw that I was represented by this person, was speaking about the issues that were important to me. Um, yet they didn't seem to care. Um, so after that experience, um, you know, and, and working, uh, working on different campaigns from um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's campaign to Alessandra Biagi um, to, uh, you know, the other campaigns that I've gotten the, the, the honor to work, uh, to work on, um, I've learned a lot about how this, you know, the, the campaigning system works. Um, and I, it came to me that, you know, even myself, I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, I said Alona Diverge from Scranton, Pennsylvania shouldn't be running field in the Bronx. I need, you know, Jason Santiago, Ali Kaba, these organizers born and raised here that know this community to be the ones push, pushing this forward. You know, oftentimes the way that campaigns, campaigns are ran is that people, um, you know, parachute into communities they know nothing about. Um, and then they have this tunnel vision to try to win and end up excluding, again, young people and people of color specifically. So Movement School, um, and Movement School was created um, right after we won um, um, on AOC's race in 2018, her primary race, as a way to um, 
train people from the community and be able to give back the lessons learned and all the tactics and strategies that we implemented on the campaign to be able to um, give it back and train the community to do this work. Um, and then after that, you know, now we've been able to, to grow exponentially, have a couple programs um, and been able to train organizers that have now um, been able to be the campaign staff for um, candidates like Cori Bush, um, Marie Newman, Jessica Cisneros, um, and tons of others ac across the country and state. Thank you for sharing, Ilona. Your experience really speaks to the um, the voter suppression that happens in our communities often as well. The fact that, you know, the youth aren't outreached to, that kind of suppresses their vote and doesn't include them in this um, process that we all should be um, included in, no? Especially today, Election Day, November 3rd. Um, Ilona, can you tell us, um, campaigning involves plenty of community interaction. How has your work with Movement School um, changed due to COVID-19? Absolutely. So it hasn't changed too much um, for the fact that when, I, you know, when we were creating Movement School, we wanted to be able to create a program that is accessible. So one that is not only that it is free, um, you know, there's not a lot of training programs that teach you how to do this work that are free. Um, and also that we wanted to make it accessible for working class people because that was that you know that is who we wanted to train up which means that we decided to create our program to be completely digital and to be in the evenings so since movement schools inception our programs have been completely digital and online um, so that you know people don't feel like they need to be in a physical space because they have work they have kids um, you know life is crazy these days. So we wanna make it as accessible as possible for everyone. So in terms of our programming, it hasn't changed too much, but definitely the urgency um, to be able to train more people, um, to be able to do these jobs, to go out there and organize, and especially with the expansion of our work here locally in, in, in New York um, with our NYCHA program, right? responding to the humanitarian crisis that is currently happening right now in NYCHA um, and is just exacerbated with this pandemic. So it definitely has, it, it, it you know, it has shaken it up in, in terms of creating more urgency, um, but in terms of our programming has, has been pretty sustainable. Thank you. Um, let's get into the situation over at NYCHA and let's learn about NYCHA's Green New Deal. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? What is it and what will it mean for NYCHA public housing residents? Absolutely. Um, so the Green New Deal for public housing is this ambitious plan to decarbonize the entire public housing stock in all of America while also being able to provide good high paying union jobs to public housing tenants. When we talk about the Green New Deal for NYCHA specifically, NYCHA, as some of you may know, is the largest public, uh, public housing um, authority in the entire Western Hemisphere. One in 15 New Yorkers lives in NYCHA. There are currently half a million people that live in NYCHA right now, um, and 98% people of color. Um, so when we think about, you know, all of the things that we're fighting for right now, especially under this current administration, right? Uh, racial justice and equity, um, being able to, uh, you know, being able to fight for housing as a human right, being able to fight for climate justice. The Green New Deal for NYCHA really encompasses all of those things. And it's for once finally centering the people who are most vulnerable to these, uh, to these systemic, uh, to the systemic oppression. Um, and that is the people that live in public housing. Here in New York, lots of our public housing are on waterfronts. They, you know, the cli uh, any climate disasters that happen, they are the first ones to feel that impact. We see down on the Lower East Side when Sandy hit, a lot of those developments um, are still in shambles. Um, tenants in those developments are living with, you know, increased cases of mold and, and lead, and there hasn't been any rehab um, to be able to fix those apartments and especially being in the middle of a pandemic, those conditions just create the perfect storm to be able to quite literally, um, you know, affect the tenants in a way that affects their health. Um, you know, and, and especially in a, in, in, a, in a country where we don't have uh, access to, everyone does not have access to healthcare, right? 
we are quite literally, NYCHA is quite literally facing a humanitarian crisis right now. Um, and no one is doing anything about it. So the Green New Deal uh, for NYCHA specifically would not only decarbonize and retrofit um, the public housing developments that we currently have right now in NYCHA, but it's also putting back to work the tenants that live in NYCHA to be able to rebuild public housing in a dignified way. And I think the, the most important um, you know, piece to this all is that this legislation was written with public housing tenants every step of the way. Um, and I you know, want to applaud Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Bernie Sanders who allowed us, you know, who, who have this vision of how legislation should be created and that it should be created from the bottom up with those who are mostly impacted. So every single bit of this plan um, was crafted by public housing tenants. So it is preserving public housing, which is section nine, being able to expand the tenant opportunities program to be able to invest in the people that work in, um, that live in public housing. And on top of that, creating, you know, a sustainable and healthy living condition to be able to give them a fighting chance at success. Um, so the Green New Deal for NYCHA is so critical, um, not only for you know the half uh, half a million people that live in NYCHA right now, um, but also as a means to get us out of this pandemic um, and to be able to you know fight back against the humanitarian crisis right happening right now in NYCHA. How can people um, make a change and get this Green New Deal out up and running um, through their votes, especially, Alona? Can you just share that before we go? And also, how can they join um, in the fight for Green New Deal in public housing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, obviously, Movement School, we have the Reclaim program, which we work with public housing tenants um, to teach them and give them the, school, uh, the, the tools and the skills that they need to organize within their developments and be able to support their leadership in doing this um, and you know in this program we obviously talk a lot about the green new deal um, we talk about nycha specific issues and also what's so unique about nycha specifically is that the tenants um at nycha it's not necessarily you know they're people call it tenant organizing but the tenants in NYCHA have such a unique position because they're public housing tenants they're under section nine um, which means that they have a slew of federal rights that are granted to them that normal tenants do not have, which means that they have so much power that ten I don't even think tenants realize. And something that I, I, I always express to tenants is saying that NYCHA has an immense amount of political capital. They could literally decide who the next mayor will be, they can decide who the next governor will be, they can decide any candidate up and down the ballot because New York City is so um, saturated with public housing. So, you know, I, I see public housing as like this sleeping giant um, and it's finally starting to wake up and realize that the tenants actually have the power. Um, because again, something that I always mention is you know, the, the original idea of public housing was to be able to build up the middle class. But what happened was that the disinvestment from our federal government over the years has left it in shambles in its current um, condition. And, but in reality, tenants have so much power to be able to fight back against this, right? But obviously our government does a really good job at trying to bully us into thinking that we do not have that power. So something that we really focus on is, is trying to instill that power and empower NYCHA tenants to realize that they do have this power, they can come out on top, and they can advocate for a better life for them and their kids and their families. Um, so in terms of you know, what's going to be happening today um, with, with the election, um, you know, I'm not afraid to say that I, you know, Biden was not my first choice. Um, however, I do, I, I do see this moment um, to be incredible, it's so critical in the course of our future uh, for this country. Um, and I think that Biden will at least 
listened to activists, listened to organizers on the ground, and has at least made an effort to try to incorporate um, some of our biggest issues. Um, and especially um, one testament to that was, you know, the creation of the Biden Bernie Task Force and where they were able to craft together Biden's climate plan. Um, so, you know, I will be voting for Joe Biden on the working families party line. Um, that's also incredibly important to that we save the working families party line. And I think that, um, definitely NYCHA tenants, again, need to realize that they truly have this political power and they are the ones in, you know, the driver's seat when it comes to um, the future that they want to have for, for public housing. Thank you so much, Ilona, for your time today. I wish we had more time to delve more into this um, important topic, but thank you. Thank you again. Of course. Folks, you can follow at MVMT School on social media and visit movementschool.us to find out more about NYCHA's Green New Deal and all the movements happening at Movement School. We'll be right back. Who's most at risk for coronavirus? People over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, and they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. And there's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people. Well, it's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. Welcome back. Every other Saturday, local artists and businesses set up at the Maria Sola Green Space in Mont Haven between Lincoln Avenue and 134th Street for a South Bronx swap meet. Joining us now to share more is DJ Charlie Hustle of South Bronx Swap Meet. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Sonia. It's great to meet you. Of Thanks course. So Wonderful meeting you as well. So let's get right into it. For those who are not familiar, can you tell us a little bit about the South Bronx Swap Meet? What is it? What is a swap meet? And for those who don't know, and where and when does it take place? Absolutely. So I actually got the term swap meet um, in Los Angeles. I DJ and I'm the tour DJ for Bronx rap artist named Kemba. And so every time we visited Los Angeles, everywhere we go, I actually go thrifting. But every time we go to Los Angeles, I go to these things called swap meets. And basically, it's just another word for a flea market. And there's lots of local vendors and artists, and they sell all different types of items, both new and used. Um, and it's just a, an awesome community vibe. So I've always wanted to kind of spread some of that up here, uptown in the Bronx and Harlem. Sounds amazing. And I know Kemba, Kemba Land. He's dope from the That's Bronx. That's right. Check him out. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, 
Yep. Amazing to know that you are the DJ as well. Um, so just to give a little background on, you know, how long you've been DJing and how you got into, you know, developing a swap meet for the Bronx through your music and also how work has changed for you during the COVID pandemic. So I got to try to condense everything as much as I can. Um, I've been DJing um, my whole life pretty much. I grew up in a bar and I had access to records and turntables as a teenager and stuff. And I was DJing in the bar um, from an early age, um, particularly with the swap meet. Um, it's something that came about um, over the last two years, I would say. I've been struggling with a lot of grief. Um, my little sister, Martha, passed away on October 13th, two years ago. My it's been really tough and one of the things that has been comforting to me has been going thrifting again so when we were little my mom used to take us thrifting and she used to say we can go to the department store and get one pair of pants and one shirt or we can go to the thrift store and you can get a whole bag a whole garbage bag so it's always been nice for our family and and, and since my sister passed it's been nice for me to do that again with my sisters and my mom and um this time around trying to figure out how i can make a business out of it because it's something that I love to do. Um, and it's also an amazing thing to do for the environment and the community because a lot of this stuff would end up in landfills, uh, polluting the, the world and stuff. So I just generally think thrifting is something more people in the world should be doing um, for the environment. And so another thing that started in the last year is I started helping a lady in the Bronx clean out her house. Um, it's a wonderful person named Peggy and shout out to her. And as part of our cleaning, we've been sorting and we realize a lot of the stuff still has value in our house that we don't just want to throw it out. Um, once COVID hit, we had to stop work, but we had amassed so much stuff um, between her and me of taking some of the stuff from her um, that we were like, what are we going to do with all this stuff? Um, so over the summer, I came up with this idea for the South Bronx Swap Meet uh, as a way to help me and Peggy get rid of some of our stuff and also encourage other people to um, you know, look, take a look at their clutter and their hoarding in their house and, and figure out if somebody else could get a better use out of some of these items. Wow, thank you so much for sharing and my condolences to you and your family, Charlie, on the loss of your sister. Um, mm -hmm. It's incredible to hear that there's some nostalgic um, and personal emotional um, purpose to the swap meet that happens here in the South Bronx as well. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, just to inform our viewers, what types of items are sold um, at the South Bronx swap meet? What can people find there? We have a very eclectic group of vendors and a wide variety of stuff. So Peggy has vintage home goods and collectibles and antiques. We have Freddie with action figures and toys, vintage toys. Um, we have Dandy in the Bronx that has menswear, suits and, and ties. Uh, Isabella LaRue and Tumama Vintage, they both have women's clothing, bags, um, jewelry. We have a lemonade stand that's run by a 13 year old writer. Um, named Cadence. Um, we have food, we have grandmas, we have uncles and aunts come by, whole families. Um, and so it, it's, it's really um, any and everything. And we're encouraging anybody that has anything to sell or to offer, maybe not even to sell if it's just ideas or, or, or just some cool information to share, to come on and set up a table. And if it's not with us, maybe they can do it on their block or other areas of New York City. I think in general, um, it should happen everywhere. And I was actually inspired by seeing a lot of street vendors popping up around Mott Haven to then start this um, flea market. Do we also have music by DJ Charlie D? Charlie Hustle, my bad. That's right, that's right. Yep, I play music. I have a little boom box, as you can see right behind me. I bring that out and I've been playing some records. I also sell records. Um, so it, it's fun. And the, the places I went to in Los Angeles, they always had bands and music. Um, and so the idea would be, um, as things get a little bit safer with COVID, we want to start having music and performances, maybe an open mic. Um, there's lots of ideas. Actually, there's a lot across the street. As we grow, I want to try to use that lot. And the DOT, I made a request with them to use it, and there'd be a lot more space. So it, it'd feel a little bit safer, too. Yeah. Best of luck with that. Um, that would be amazing. Um, speaking of COVID-19, you know, how are vendors and buyers stationed safely during the pandemic? I know that it's outdoors, so that allows for, you know, safe distancing as well. But just for those who may be a little worried about going out during these times. Absolutely. It's been a big concern for me. My fiance has um, asthma, so we've been pretty much locked down since March, working from home and everything and staying 
socially distanced and, and everything like that, wearing a mask everywhere we go. So all of our vendors are supposed to, are required to wear masks and have hand sanitizer. We also encourage all of the shoppers to wear a mask and we have masks provided if you don't have one. And then each space I, I've made 10 by six feet with six feet in between. So there's a, some social distance in between all of the vendors. So we're doing the best we can to try to keep people safe. And if we end up growing and it gets too big where there's a big crowd forming, that's where we want to then transition to a bigger space. But for right now, I've had as many as 13 vendors and we've had, um, you know, we catch a lot of people walking by and people that are going into the garden. So it, it hasn't been a huge crowd yet. So that, uh, that's, and that's kind of actively, we're not trying to make it into a huge crowd yet. Um, so people are safe. So it's definitely something that we, we have to always be mindful of and we don't want anyone to get sick or any of our vendors to get sick. Mm -hmm. So I, I get COVID tested every couple of weeks just in case. And um, yeah, I'm encouraging all of my vendors and, and everyone that comes by to just be diligent as possible to, to be safe, you know. Gotcha. Thank you, Charlie, for sharing. Um, let's talk a little bit about your partnership also with the Maria Sola Garden that, you know, you stationed in front of. How did you develop that partnership in order to have the swap meet there in that location? So I think community gardens are very, very important in New York City and the Bronx specifically. I've been supporting a park called Brook Park, um, and it's a community garden on 141st Street in Brook. Um, there are awesome people there, and I've been um, supporting them for 10 years. So once the Maria Sola st garden started to develop over the last few years, I actually live closer to the Maria Sola. And uh, some of my friends are members of the garden and I reached out to my friend, Michael Johnson, who um, ended up giving us permission and inviting us to vend on the sidewalk. Got you. All right, Danny over at Broke Park Gardens. I know him. Yep. <laughs> He's one of the, yeah, one of the Danny, elders that runs it. Danny Cervoni, yep. And, yeah. and, Henry and all the guys there, we love them very much. And we've been inspired by their park um, to, do, to do some of the things we've been doing at Maria Sola. That is beautiful. So before we go, DJ Charlie Hustle, can you just tell us um, how people can sign up to vend at the South Bronx Swap Meet if they are interested? And if there are any restrictions, like can they sell anything at the Swap Meet? Um, you can sell anything as long as within legal uh, parameters. Um, you can sign up by emailing me at South Bronx Swap Meet at Gmail. Include your name and the type of items that you have to sell. And I'm formulating a, a vendor's list. Um, and when there's space, I can fit you in. Um, but even if there isn't space, because sometimes it, it gets the list gets full, still email me and I can keep you on that vendors list so that when we transfer into a bigger space, I'll have this whole network of vendors already set. So anybody that's interested in selling and um, being an entrepreneur and figuring out ways to be self-sustainable, I, I know a lot of artists like myself have been out of work. So it's, a, it's just a great way for people to get a little extra income, including myself. And um, it, it's been almost a godsend and, and it's been a lot of fun to meet neighbors I haven't met before and lots of people are coming out and um, very excited. So it's a beautiful thing. And I'm so happy to be here to talk with you guys about it. We're happy to have you. Before we go, one last thing, just invite our viewers to pass by and visit the vendors and show support for local artists and vendors at this time. Absolutely. South Bronx and the Bronx in general, come check us out at the South Bronx Swap Meet, November 14th and 21st. We've got something for everybody, great prices and a great family vibe. So come check us out. If you want to be a, vember, a vendor, come uh, email me at South Bronx Swap Meet at Gmail. And for everything else, check out our IG at, at South Bronx Swap Meet. Thanks again. Peace. You heard it here from DJ Charlie Hustle. You can follow at South Bronx Swap Meet for updates on Instagram. You can also support local artists and businesses every other Saturday, 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. over at between Lincoln Avenue and 134th Street. So you already know, get out there and, you know, get some vintage items over at the South Bronx Swap Meet. Yep. We'll be right back. The looming financial deficits are so near and so large that every way of reducing costs quickly must be a serious consideration. The MTA is facing the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. It needs $16 billion in federal funds to continue to operate through 2020 until 2024. In an October 13th phone call with reporters, New York State Comptroller Thomas DiNapoli says the financial crisis can, quote, mark the end of regional public transit as we know it. 
But what does this mean for a city with 8.4 million people, many who rely on Metropolitan Transit Authority? We reached out to the MTA for an answer to DiNapoli's statement, but didn't get a direct response. However, press statements dating back to September indicate that if a federal bailout isn't provided, more layoffs and service interruptions are to come. MTA CEO Patrick J. Foy said in part, federal funding for mass transit isn't a red or blue issue. It's a jobs issue. Our future and the fate of approximately 100,000 MTA-created out-of-state jobs rest squarely in the hands of the Senate and White House. When our transit system fails, it's a domino system, then our small businesses will have to shut down, um, and then jobs will um, shut down. Stephanie Brugos Verez with the Writers Alliance says she's never seen a financial crisis this large and says the only way out is funds from the feds or major service disruptions are coming. They're going to remove some Metro North lines. They're um, estimating that riders will have to wait 10 to 20 minutes more for a train um, and 20 to 25 minutes more for a bus. The transit is not a reliable option or the better option. People are going to A, either get a car or two, leave New York City completely. And leaving New York is a viable option for many shop hangers who say they can't afford fare raises. I would move out of the state, yes I would. It's too much of a hassle, $3 every day to go somewhere, multiple times a day, you know, it's too much. The MTA has already tightened up by limiting employees' hours and cutting back on overtime. However, they still need a federal bailout. Now with the presidential election just next week, that isn't a high priority in Washington right now. Reporting for BronxNet, Darissa White. While nearly 80 million Americans have already casted their votes early, the Bronx is preparing to turn out tonight for Election Day. Joining us now to rally us out to get out and vote and also remind us what this election means for our borough and more is Council Member of D16, Vanessa Gibson. Welcome, Council Member. We're always happy to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me today. I appreciate it. Of course. One of the first things I wanted to mention is that you're one of the most energetic speakers in the Bronx to get people to rally and vote. And we're always have to gl glad to have you. Like I said, how are we turning up the volume and rallying the Bronx to get out and vote virtually and safely in, in person this election day? So I think there's been a lot of efforts underway by elected officials, advocates, leaders, you know, different community groups, organizations like Common Cause New York, uh, Justice Votes. I've joined many of them at in-person press conferences, virtual press conferences. We joined the Morrisania Band Project and we had a virtual concert that was hosted by Bronx Net a few weeks ago. And we really wanna encourage residents and eligible voters of the importance of voting, the fundamental right that we have as Americans to exercise our right to vote. And reminding ourselves of the fact that our ancestors were subjected to poll taxes and literacy exams and so many other things to disenfranchise voters, particularly marginalized people of color that have often been underrepresented. And so it's really important that we continue to get out the vote. Every day should we get out the vote. And this is also the first time um, that we have early voting for a presidential election. So I think it's even more exciting. Uh, and the fact that there's so much on the line in this president's race for our, our next president and next vice president, we have to act as if everything is on the line because everything really is on the line. 
Thank you, Council Member. Um, last week here in the Bronx, lines were very long and spirits were high since the beginning of early voting. What did you hear from Bronx sites participating in early voting just last week? Were there any challenges? So I think Bronxites were excited about early voting. I think with any election, there's always a challenge. So not every voter knew where their early voting polling site was because it may not be the same as their traditional voting site on general election on election day. So there was a little bit of confusion and not everyone has internet access to go to the city's board of elections website. So getting beyond that confusion for people that did know where their early voting polling site was, uh, there are 17 that were in the Bronx over a nine day period from October 24th through November 1st. So there were long lines, a lot of people that were just very patient, right? And understanding you didn't hear people arguing, cussing each other out and yelling, screaming, you know, yelling at the poll workers. Uh, everybody was very patient. You had a lot of organizations and elected officials that were giving out food, pizza, water, PPE, you know, to remind them of the importance of voting, to thank them for their patience, their cooperation. I even saw lots of creative things. I saw people with chairs. I saw folks reading, you know, books, uh, listening to music. I saw folks dancing. I mean, we were just getting it on because it's, a, it's exciting. It's exciting to be a part of the democratic process when you realize that our ancestors stood on very long lines too. So years later in 2020, I think many people understood the reason why we're waiting on long lines because we're voting in a COVID-19 world where you can't, you know, use polling sites to their fullest capacity. You have to social distance. We have to protect ourselves, right? We're wearing face masks. So I think when you put all of that together and you know the reality we're facing today, many people are more than understanding of being on a very long line to vote. The Bronx made it happen, even in yes. early elections, and they're turning out tonight for election day, November 3rd. Um, yes. I want to mention, Council Member, that as we know, the Bronx has been subject of historically low voter turnouts. The South Bronx in particular, for example, only had 32% of people vote in the last midterm election. That's low compared to nearby communities and the country. Council Member, how are you feeling about the Bronx's turnout so far? I'm feeling really good because I've seen some of the early voting numbers. So on day one, there were 14,000 plus Bronx voters that came out. And then it's a cumulative ad. And day two, we were at 30,000. Day three, we went up to 40,000. Um, and so every day we got several thousand voters from the Bronx that came out to one of those 17 early voting polling sites. It's encouraging. It's also a reminder of the past history of the Bronx being one of the lowest counties with lower voter turnout. And I think it's a reminder that we have traditional voters, our older voters that always come out in every single election. But as we educate, as we encourage, as we promote and raise the level of awareness, you have a younger generation that is coming out to vote. And that's what you saw on those long lines. You saw young people, you saw seniors, you saw veterans, you saw so many people. And I really hope that you know, at the end of the night, when we get the results, you'll see that the Bronx's numbers in this year's election turned out higher than ever before. What top issues are on the line for the Bronx this election season, Council Member? Just a reminder to our um, viewers that are voting tonight, what issues are on the line? Goodness. I, first, I say everything. Everything is on the line. <laughs> Affordable housing is on the line. Public housing, small business protection, uh, MWBE reform, making sure that we deal with climate change and environmental justice. Public education is always a top agenda. Access to quality and affordable health care remains a priority, food access for us in the Bronx, and really surviving and rebuilding from COVID-19. The thousands of Bronx sites that we lost to this deadly pandemic were older Bronx residents with underlying health conditions. It meant that they had asthma, high blood pressure, heart disease, they were obese. They had so many preventable diseases that were further exacerbated when they got COVID, and they died as a result of that. We were dealing with these health disparities pre-COVID, during COVID, and now after COVID. And so food access, focusing on urban agriculture, farming, health bucks, nutrition, healthy foods, healthy food options, those are all priorities that we all have. So I say everything is at stake. Everything was on the ballot line because all of these issues are interconnected and have to work together. And we know we're electing a president and vice president tonight, but let's also remind voters of the local races that they may see on the ballot um, this evening and why those races are just as important. 
Yeah, so also in addition to president and vice president of the United States, we are also voting for our members of Congress, the House of Representatives. Um, and so we are supporting, you know, our Democratic candidates like Richie Torres, like Congresswoman Alexandria or Casio Cortez, as well as Jamal Bowman, uh, newly elected as well, uh, and Adriano Espayat. Uh, those are our members of Congress that cover the Bronx. And then Going down to the state level, we also have the members of the New York State Senate and the New York State Assembly who are up for re-election on the ballot this year. And then locally in the Bronx, we have three candidates that are going to be Supreme Court justices. Um, and those names that I know of are Andrew Cohen, uh, my colleague in the city council, Kim Wilson and Bianca Perez are the three candidates who are on the ballot for Supreme Court justice. There we go. Council Member Gibson just gave us a full on ballot right there. <laughs> we have no excuse and not know who's running, right? Yes, yes. And also today we've got two options. We can drop off our absentee ballots no later than 9 p.m. or we right. can in person to the poll sites, of course, just by remaining safely distant, six feet apart, wearing our masks and being safe. Council Member, can you help provide our viewers with some reminders and tips for either option? Right. So, you know, just reminding everyone of the option of voting by absentee ballot. Uh, you can return your ballot to the Bronx Board of Elections uh, tonight by 9 p.m. at 1780 Grand Concourse. Uh, that is just north of Mount Eden uh, in our district. And then also in person, as long as you are on the line uh, before nine o'clock, you will be allowed the opportunity to vote. So even if the line is long and it's past nine o'clock, if you are already on the line, they will not turn you away. Do not get offline. You stay there and you wait until you vote. Uh, there is nothing more important than exercising your right to vote. And I think we are reminded by four years of this federal administration and what we've seen with COVID and so many things that have happened across the country that voting is a fundamental right. So many people have been disenfranchised and, and dissuaded from voting formerly incarcerated men and women, people of color, women, marginalized community, immigrant communities. So many people have been told you can't vote and you shouldn't vote. ICE is going to be at the polling site. They're gonna deport you. None of that stuff is true, but people are very worried because they hear some of the rhetoric from this president. So I remind everyone that yes, your vote counts. Yes, we need to make sure that we're voting because when we all vote, we have the ability to count and we have the ability to win and this is not just for us, this current generation. When you vote, you are voting for the future generation of young kings and queens in our communities that deserve better than we received. Thank you so much, Council Member Gibson, for joining us this evening. And get out and vote, y'all. You heard it here. Yes, that's right. Get out and vote. Vote like it counts. <laughs> a reminder, you heard at the Bronx, get out and vote today, election day, November 3rd. If you're voting absentee, make sure you drop off your ballot at the poll site by 9 p.m. today or at the Bronx County Board of Elections office no later than November 3rd today by 9 p.m. If you're voting in person, you can find your poll site and view a sample ballot at findmypollsite.vote.nyc. Just remember to wear your mask, remain six feet apart, and sa safely head out to the polls to have your vote count and your voice heard this evening. That's all for our show today. Thank Thank you for tuning into BXRX. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, wishing you and your family safety and wellness now and always. Get out and vote, y'all.